coral or an anemone as it should be should be called because it's not coral that icon is not a coral like it's, it's an anemone an an oh my goodness i will never forgive the community for this i'm still a little salty over it like salt water which coral is i'm so sorry just please forgive me for that. anyway the crashing tide we're going to be doing a crashing tide guide today tide guide So the crashing tide has this cool mechanic called tides, which allow it to build up having a lot of passive effects until you get oh, so many in play, which results in this final turn of really great stuff. But every time you rest, they fall off. But that's not it. It's got the ability to play three cards per turn. So when you're playing three cards per turn, juggling two elements, and you also have to deal with managing water tiles and all this, that can be a lot. And even with a giant hand size and a giant health pool, you think, wow, this sounds really great. But there is a lot going on, and some of the cards are a little bit down-tuned to take into the fact you're going to have a lot of abilities in play, and you're going to be playing three cards per turn. So how do you balance that? How do you play it? What do you do? I personally think it's fun, but enough foreplay. Let's dig into it. If you want more Fast Haven guides and Gloomhaven 2nd Edition coverage and all sorts of fun stuff, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to help the channel, just hit like. It really helps. But if you really want to help us, check out our Patreon. You'll have early access to videos and other stuff, including a patrons-only channel and my Discord. Tides are a persistent effect that give you a permanent boost as long as they're in play. You, There is no limit. It's, it's very similar to the Mind Thief's Augments or the Drifter's cards, but they're not losses, and unlike the Mind Thief's Augments, there's no limit to the amount you can have in play. So you could have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 Tides in play. So you can have so many Tides in play if you can pull it off. However, um, Tides usually just say, hey, you get this cool benefit until you rest. Uh, so if you spend a lot of actions putting tides into play that's not a lot of tides that's not a lot of actions spent actually using those tides although some of them are pretty passive like have shield you don't necessarily need to take actions to have shield but you probably should position yourself to utilize that so you get hit over your allies additionally all tides infuse elements if you spend the whole scenario playing tides but not using those elements you're probably wasting some of it so you have to kind of find that balance but the main thing is tides stay persistent until you rest short or long rest if you do long rest it waits until after you you don't it's not when you declare the long rest it's when you take it that they fall off so if you long rest you actually have all your tides active during that turn which is cool for stuff that actually provide defensive effects because uh, it means that if you do long rest you actually have cool defensive abilities active during that round the big thing ends up being you have this tempo uh this usually like in between rest cycles um, a lot of people might come out with the, of a rest cycle with like their best cards and like start hitting really hard. But you have the reverse effect going into a rest cycle. The final thing is going to be your biggest. But a lot of times you'll have like straight up dead turns uh, in the first round of every scenario. And all, often dead turns coming out of um, rests. Because you'll probably be playing like usually and we're going to be just like saying something like rancid brine or sharp chitin on top something like that maybe shock later and the bottom is almost always going to be overwhelming wave so you're like cool that what does that do it'll give you two elements great and then puts two passive effects into play but then gives you no immediate benefits you don't move you don't attack nothing over the scenario you're going to have several dead turns and then it makes up for the fact that a lot of times right before tides you'll be able to do like right before rests with uh, six tides in play, you might actually have stuff like, hey, I've got this shield in play. I've got like this cool thing where I'm going to add all these conditions to these attacks and I've got the, I'm going to heal and blah. And then like once I rest, when I long rest, I'm going to perform a heal eight self. And you're like, what the hell is going on here? And it's great. We love it. But that tempo sometimes is a little bit annoying, especially if you're like in a two player group and someone needs something, but you're like, hey, I have to rest and that will drop all my tides and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's just hard to work around. Keep in mind, because the amount of tides and the amount of actions you play, loss effects, this is a 12 card class, but you don't play it like a tinkerer or something. You do, Like a tinkerer can say, hey, you know what? Burn losses. I don't care. This is great. This class is not like that because it hampers the amount of tides, the amount of actions you can play. Because you can play three cards per turn, which we'll get to the card in a minute, you actually burn through the cards fairly quickly, potentially. It's just not... Um, a class that losses play into. Now, now I'm not going to say never burn losses, but I will weight my decision making on what cards to pick. I will be a little bit more um, harsh on losses, even though I personally think that Frosthaven is a good indicator of like, I think in Frosthaven, 
people who got used to Gloomhaven and got Barry Loss Averse might not play so over so well, but the Crashing Tide is definitely one of those Loss Averse classes, in my opinion. If I rate some loss effects lo uh, lower than like what another class would do, um, it is deliberate. But the main tide that you're going to be using um, is this card called Overwhelming Wave. So let's actually talk about that right now. Overwhelming Wave. So we're going to first talk about the ability on top and then the tide effect on bottom because there's a lot of really cool interactions with how this works. First off, it is easily your best level, actually any low level non-loss attack. Doing an attack three and that kind of a cleave with one experience tied to it is really powerful. As a matter of fact, most of these classes actions are weak. This is actually a really strong one, but they're mostly balanced on the fact that playing three cards per turn, if you already had like stuff that compared to some other classes like the Blink Blade, um, you would be very too powerful because like the Blink Blade, it pays a lot to be able to play three cards per turn and it's only a limited window. And this could be as long as you can keep this card into play, the one on bottom. It does trade off by saying, if you play the top attack, which is really good, it does mean that you are not using the three card bottom or you're gonna have to stand potion to get it back, so on and so forth. Um, the whole point it ends up being is, you're gonna have to go through hoops or some find some way to play that bottom card or something like that, like um, to get the benefits of both. So if you're just playing the two, 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 and then doing the big hit, like sure, that's, that's possible, but um, it's harder to ramp up those tides into play if you are only playing two cards per turn or it's hard to get the most out of it so um as a result it's you have to kind of juggle this in general due to the way this class runs i always am going to suggest in almost every situation you're going to be playing the bottom half now this also has this critical point around eight cards because once you get to eight cards you can play a top tide and the um overwhelming wave on bottom three three and then you're forced to rest after that point, it's two, three, two. You're only actually getting one for one after the eight card point. So um, it's roughly around there that you have to start consider, is this something you want to do? Do you have the stand potions to fuel it? Do you want to try to burn out faster? And so on and so forth. Um, you may or may not end up after that, after that specific point, you, it's, it's kind of up to you because you can still use the bottom for cool effects. Um, but at the same time, you may not get the greatest benefit out of it, and it may be better to just like um, put something into play that says all your attacks have poison, then do that big cleave. So now it's an attack three poison on everything. Like, it, it starts to pay off better when it's no longer providing like three extra plays per rest cycle, which is big. Three get, getting to play three additional cards before a rest is huge. Getting to play one more is nice, but pitching a card or discarding a card to play one more card in another turn isn't really as big a payoff as one card to get three more cards a turn uh, over three or more, one more card a turn for three turns after it. It's definitely has a bit of a weight value, but I personally think eight is the cutoff. I think any, if your hand size is eight and higher, it's almost 99.9% .9 of the time, um, it's gonna be better to play the bottom. And if your hand size is under eight, I think that's where you start have to start doing the judgment call. I do think once your hand size is six, it's just basically, not a good idea to use the bottom, but hey, also I, I personally don't think this is one of those cards you lose because I think the top is too valuable um, as an attack anyway compared to your other cards. So three card evasion. So something that's actually really neat is um, the first off the the battle <laughs> the battle crab. I almost said crashing tide has a lot of abilities that say attack and move, move and attack, or just cards that are good attacks. Um, and you have the ability to drop water. Um, we're gonna get to that in the section below, but keep in mind one core strategy you can use is being able to um, move in and either move out, move in, attack, move out uh, against enemies that are either not moving or not moving very much, or you're, you can effectively do those effective disarms. You can make it to where um, you can hit enemies that are further away and back out. You don't have usually a lot of movement, but you might be able to um, use certain boots that allow you to get certain bonuses to them. Also, there is a card called Skitter, although I'm definitely more a fan of using the top of it. That's going to be a, like a story of a lot of the Crashing Tide cards is weighing which top and bottom to use because there's a lot of really good cards, but some of them are stacked on both sides, so you're going to have to start making judgment calls. 
The ability to move in, attack, move out is something usually you only see on the Blink Blade, but because you have the ability to like drop water pretty handily, um, being able to like move in, drop water, move out, and saying like, aha, now I'm two hexes away from the enemy and there's a water, they're going to need to do a move three and maybe against if you're fighting enemies that are doing move ones and move twos, you'll be able to more readily dodge those and prevent the attacks from even landing. This will be good for where we're going to be talking about the striker and controller builds later. But like the defenders, usually you're going to put in a lot of these um, defensive cards anyway. You may just be using um, more heals and shields over that. But this is still something in your like kit if you're like, oh gosh, this guy's going to do an attack six, which is just not optimal. Uh, a lot of those uh, heavy hits are usually like uh, late initiatives or no movement tied to them. So just try to balance that out. Speaking of water... Um, Keep in mind, there's one really mega perk that says you have advantage on all attacks while you're in water or while the enemy you're targeting is in water. Um, that's just a really good perk. But you also have some cards that's like Bane and enemy in water are like, it's technically normal or elite, which is sad because you can't like Bane bosses in water, which would be cool. But like a lot of times I think this has bigger payoffs on elites anyway. But I digress. Whole point is you have the ability to not just drop water for effects, like poison enemies in water nearby or bane enemies or something like that. But you'll often have stuff that are, are like just using what water is, which is it takes extra movement to move into. Let's say you do drop um, some water tiles. Uh, say like, let's say this enemy only has three hexes to move to get you, but you actually move, put drop one water tile adjacent to you. That hex is now going to cost an extra to move into. They're going to need to move four. They don't. So now you've actually dodged the attack just by dropping water. So sometimes you want to drop water on enemies to put a debuff on them. Sometimes you're going to want to drop water on yourself so you can have a buff or, you know, use your perk. Other times you're going to want to drop water in specific spaces just to prevent enemies from taking attacks on you. This is largely only going to affect melee attackers, so your toolkit is far better engineered towards neutralizing melee threats, but you several, have several tools for dealing with ranged enemies as well. Speaking of element generation, all tides generate elements, all, all bottom tides generate dark, and all top tides generate light. Pretty basic, so you're going to have to figure out um, specifically how to do that tempo. Usually you'll have a setup turn and have like both elements available on the round after, but the biggest thing ends up usually being that um, as you go throughout the cycle, as you drop more tides, you'll have um, to find out other ways to use them, figuring out, am I going to drop maybe two tides and one other card this turn to make sure I have two, and using those elements appropriately, and to make sure you either get the high effect or the experience. I personally don't think that maximizing every element for every experience is necessary, because between certain actions and all the element spending you will be doing, this is a high experience generating class to begin with. So it's not like you have to try super hard to get experience. You you will get the experience. It's it's really not that bad. <laughs> For the most part, it's going to be putting in like overwhelming wave. You're just going to like that you're going to write that for like almost the whole scenarios. It's just most strategy is going to be pick whatever top you want and then uh, overwhelming wave, smash that bottom and <laughs> overwhelming wave. Put that bottom into play and use it for its most beneficial effects and that'll set the elements forward to the other cool cards. Now that we've talked a lot, a lot about these concepts, let's talk about what builds we're going to be strategizing around and then just dig into the cards. We're going to be talking about three builds today. There's going to be a controller, striker, and defender. Almost always I tell people if you're like in all these builds, I'm like, hey, if you're not sure which one to play, go for the striker build. It's usually good for anything in two player, blah, 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 blah. This is slightly different. I'm going to actually suggest that if you're not sure which one to go with, go with the Defender build. The Defender build's easy to play. It's fun. It's also harder to go wrong because it it's it's primarily a um, I am an unkillable battle crab tank and I'm punishing people for being next to me. It's very easy to play. It's fun. It's 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 fun, but it's the other ones have some pretty cool benefits that could actually weigh better for certain groups, but the defender is basically going to be good in all groups. The only problem is usually when you have two um, characters that want to get hit. So if you have, if no one in your party wants to get hit, the defender is an easy choice. So just kind of pick what you need, but if, if you're new to the class, I'd go with that. But there's will be a striker build which focuses more on debuffing enemies and doing many attacks over and over, and a controller build that focuses a little bit more on water to zone out enemies. Again on water though, keep in mind, 
Water's really cool, but it also does screw with your allies. So if your allies, if you have like a really heavy melee party, I'd maybe not consider the controller build because if you have like four people and all want to get up and you're dropping water, you may actually hinder your allies more than you're hindering enemies. So the cards, I mean, the first one's Overwhelming Wave. I think I talked about that one sufficiently enough. The top is a very good attack, your best attack for a long time, um, but the it's tied to the bottom of play three cards. You have to make that decision for yourself. Um, again, the eight point is the point of emphasis here. We'll just move on to the other cards other than that, since I've already covered this pretty thoroughly. Soft Flesh. Now, uh, I do like a lot of the Crashing Tide cards, but this is definitely one that I'm not as fond of. Um, extra durability is never a bad thing. Um, getting to get extra heals every time. So anytime an adjacent enemy dies uh, before your next rest, you perform a heal oneself, which adds a lot to your durability because you might take some hits. And then maybe if you're next to the enemy and an ally kills it, boom, you get a free heal. You, you kill it on your turn, boom, you get a free heal. This will add up over the course of rest and still be pretty decent. However, usually it requires like a lot of enemies to die to get the benefit of it. And it's a little bit overkill with this other card, Cleansing Swell, which I usually prefer over this. However, it depends on the scenario for fi fighting, for example, like Snow Imps or, you know, Polar Bears, things that like wound, poison, or brittle on repeat. So let's say you're like, hey, these snow ups aren't that annoying. They're going to, you know, I take three damage plus, you know, I'm brittled. But like, so I only take two. Two's not bad. But like when you're brittled, that two becomes four damage and that adds up way more quickly. So uh, and imps have, snow imps have a small health pool. Uh, so if you just have the way to like get adjacent to them, let them die. And the heal one will heal you one, which is great, but also clean off brittle. It'll clean off bane. It'll clean off wound and poison. Um, especially if you're like fighting enemies with poison because poison blocking cleansing swell is annoying so in those scenarios the top of this is super good and obviously i take it but um it's definitely more of a situational card the bottom's still pretty good though because you can move to heal to self you only heal if you're in water you do have several ways to generate water it's going to be a little bit easier over through other levels but personally think that this card is perfectly fine i consider this more of an x card um than a one card so i'm changing sorry isaac i am making my own decisions on what's one and what next here anyway this this is kind of more of a sideboard card in my opinion sharp chitin um the tank card shield oneself infuse light it's really hard to this definitely is a card that you could talk about a lot and i'm not really going to it just reduces all incoming damage it's a good setup um, it due to its initiative, which is you don't have a lot of good initiatives, but this is fairly early. It's pretty easy to um, start every rest cycle with sharp chitin and overwhelming wave on bottom. So you're going to be tanky for nearly the entire scenario and being able to play three cards almost every turn. Um, it really just adds up. This has a huge amount of damage reduction over the course of a scenario with no drawback other than you just need to play it every rest cycle and it does give you an element that you can use so it's not like you're wasting turns you're wasting a turn to put the shield back in play and you get an element it's good the bottom we tried to make it work in play testing it's fine but i personally have just you know i've i've not been a fan of it so um but the top is something you're going to be using a lot especially on like defender controller posts striker might avoid it if you're just going pure damage down to the depths, another slightly more conditional card, but still pretty strong. Um, I almost would take it just for the move three, because you usually don't have, you have like a lot of click move two plus cool effect, and that ends up being a lot of it. And uh, I know you can play like three cards a turn, but like playing a move two effect, move two effect ends up being like move four, and it takes up two of your three card plays. So um, anyway, move three ends up being really good as a result. In those situations where there's a lot of hazardous terrain, that effect is really strong. So a uh, really easy pick just for move three, ignore hazardous terrain. Uh, in your toolkit, that's just a good card. Uh, the top is a little bit more conditional, but it's pretty good if you're actually able to, um, you know, almost finish off enemies. It'll give them one more turn and then they die. Uh, it's more important for like like living spirits or flame demons because sometimes you're like, aha, I hit this like living spirit. Oh no, I only did one damage. Living spirits for almost their whole career, one damage brings them down to three health almost every time. And if they bring them down to three health, that's a bane. That means they're just going to die during the next turn. Haha. <laughs> Although living spirits do have some heals, so you're going to have to be wary on that. Unlike flame demons, uh, they might retaliate on you a little bit, but... Um, being able to drop a Bane on a Flame Demon, we love it. And those are two of the more slightly annoying enemies, so that's pretty fun. 
I normally rate this really high because of that, but um, you have so many ways of punishing low health, high shield enemies that this doesn't become like a super great part of the toolkit. It's just part of it. That said, it's still good because if you're like, hey, I'm going to attack this enemy who's at eight health. Boom, I did five damage. They're at three. Cool, Bane. You're like, cool, let's move on to the next guy. Let that guy die and so on and so forth. We've seen scenarios where this just the, the damage this deals ends up being really strong. And like I said, if you just do a little bit of damage to living to like a flame demon uh, who has like three health left and shield four, which is, I like, think, level one, two, and three flame demons don't even get to numbers beyond that. Um, you can just watch as this drops a casual seven damage on that, because three plus their four shield. Um, getting effectively free attacks can be pretty huge. And anyway, um, it's still somewhat situational, but in those situations, it's very strong. And even outside of it, it's just a decent card. So it's pretty much an easy pick, but it'll become more rotational as you level up. Pull of Power, I'm not like super sold on this card. Um, so obviously it's a loss, but it's like, hey, do an attack four, or potentially five, and if you're in water, you're gonna attack another enemy. That That's cool. Two attack fives is really strong. That's really good for a level one loss, but um, kind of ends up all it ends up being. Um, now you're, you're like, hey, what if it's a really well-timed loss? Let's say I dropped water, but of course you have to have enough water generation. You have to be in a water and near two enemies for it really to be a very, strong card but let's see what the bottom is but the bottom is basically just a when you rest you can keep one of your tides in play which is nice that's pretty good except as a result it's like hey i'm gonna drop this bottom to just generate an element and then paying it forward you, you, you you're, you're getting a free play later now i understand if you wouldn't need to keep momentum like for certain scenarios that require like i'm thinking of one scenario where you only get like 12 rounds in it like maybe that'd be good to make sure that when you rest, nothing, not everything falls off so you can recover your tides and abilities faster. Sure, that's an option, but um, I've never really found this card to be like so important that I wanted to bring it that often. I consider it a sideboard card. Skitter, the only thing bad about this card is its initiative, boo. By the way, that's going to be a trend. The Crashing Tide has so many cards with very bad initiatives, and I hate it. 55, 54, 60, like, they're all in the, the, like, the 45 to 62 area that I hate, and it's almost every card. So sometimes if I get excited about a card, like, hey, look at this initiative, sometimes I'm just going to say, look at that initiative, and that's going to be the exciting part of the card but um this card is the opposite the initiative is trash but both sides are good um the bottom tide on this is pretty situational but super strong in those situations but the top is uh seems kind of weak at a glance with attack one move one attack one but if you have an element one of them gets buffed buff if you have both elements they both do but that does mean it's very easy to do two tides then skitter immediately after that because you will get it doesn't matter which tides you play if you play one top and one bottom tide that'll give you the elements to play skitter and then with skitter you can attack two move one attack two and if of course if you have like uh, rancid brine in play which you could just do with your three cards rancid brine and then skitter so attack two on an enemy poison them attack two which becomes three again so this kind of becomes a attack two move one attack three leave them poisoned kind of a thing which ends up being way ahead of the curve compared to um most level ones like most most level ones will not give you on average five damage before attack modifiers um poison and move one non-loss it's pretty easy to set that up to and that's pretty strong um but yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of uh, Skitter's Top. The bottom, there is going to be a lot of scenarios where you're going to need extra movement and to ignore difficult terrain, as well as water. So allowing you to, disc to ignore difficult terrain, ignore water, and have increased uh, movement. Some of those weird scenarios, like the really weird ones, uh, where there's like, uh, you know, Marcel designed it, and he's like, if, there's, if you're not using 38 overlay tiles, are you even designing a scenario? And you can make really cool scenarios without using the whole box, Marcel, um, and Matthew G. Somers. I, you, but, like, you know, um, in those scenarios, this, this really adds up a lot, especially some of those, like, get in, get out, boom, perfect, because you can very easily do multiple moves per turn, so getting plus one and then plus one, it stacks up really quickly. So top or bottom, this is a strong pick. Cleansing Swell. So let's, another weak initiative, but let's talk about the top first because I'm not as sold on it. 
um, do a couple of attack ones, he, and then move two or or push two or push three if you have uh, light, and you've got an experience if you do. Um, so the big thing about this is is um, with the like correct situation, like if you have like like I said, rancid Brian or later Shuck in play. Um, what the push three allows you to do is it's almost a disarm if you're fighting enemies that are like move one or two. So that's actually pretty strong and could add up to a lot of healing, especially if you like knock them away and wound them with shock or like maybe you uh, poison them and say, hey, once we start to jump on these guys later, um, we're going to be hitting them harder. So it can absolutely add up to um, a significant amount of uh, damage and damage prevention if they're in those situations. But if you're fighting like, you know, ice wraiths and they're like how i push you away and they're like it's okay i'm gonna be right back right now because i have like move five or something stupid um the push might not do anything and if you're fighting flying enemies but if there's like hazards and traps and stuff this can add up to a lot um so the attack is in these current situations that you might need to blah 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 blah, blah. the top is really good but in like 70 percent of the situations it's not good that said, the bottom is basically useful all the time, does nothing except give you an element, and then when you rest equal to the amount of tides you had in play when you um, rested, heal that. This is very easily a heal 5, heal 6 every time you rest, so when you long rest, it could mean that you heal 7 or 8 every time you long rest. Just whoop! and like reset like maybe you shielded yourself up took a bunch of attacks like refresh your items heal yourself up back nearly or too full and then do it all over again that ends up being incredibly strong and as a result cleansing swell is a very strong card highly recommend it especially for defenders questing force 87 initiative is good we like it um I know we want some cards to go early, but we also want some cards to go late, so I'm totally taking it. That loot, too, is a throwback to Gloomhaven, where, like, a lot of the, like, basic loot actions were just loot one, nothing else. However, because a lot of your actions are down-tuned to begin with, I actually don't hate it on this class. Also, because you can play three cards per turn. Like, one of the problems I hated with bottom loots was um, you can't move into position and then loot with one turn. Because sometimes you'd want to do that. Like, hey, I'm going to reposition, scoop all this up. But you could just play two bottoms move loot and then like put it tied into play so that's still pretty strong um so i don't i don't care if the loot is on the top or bottom for this class um so we're cool with it there uh the top action though is an attack equal to the number of tides you have in play which um if you haven't figured this out that's really strong like the worst this is going to be at low like at low levels and low stuff you're basically it's at worst like an attack five one experience and you'll probably have other stuff in play, so it's probably going to be like an attack five poison one experience, especially with no like elemental reliance. Like let's say you have like the other card that you're going to use to like spend the elements on, like so. Boom, do that. Have this be another thing, and potentially could like uh, poison them with a previous attack, and then drop this as like an attack six, attack seven. If you have six tides in play, boom, nail that on them, and just watch as you have suddenly some burst damage. You're like, this is great. Um, I don't think there was ever a scenario when we were testing this that we ever, or, you know, and playing in our campaigns, um, that this was ever not a bring. This is, this is a card you'll bring all the way to level nine, because it's hard to complain about. Oh no, it's an attack six on a level one card. Um, as you get later in the scenario, it absolutely becomes weaker. But a lot of times, once you get to the point where you're not playing that many tides, you can just pick this as one of your lost cards and you don't really feel like you miss it it's it's really nice to have cards that you want to bring to every scenario but over the course of the scenario don't mind losing so honestly it, it kind of makes it exciting in that effect crashing surge of course this is like really good generation but i'm not a big fan of water builds this is pretty good for the controller but you do get especially starting at level two better water generation but um this still can be end up pretty strong if you're trying to move and like dodge attacks from uh enemies just by moving drop some water to make it more annoying for them to approach you the attack two and that big hex is still pretty strong create a bunch of water tiles is still pretty strong but it's a loss I'm not really super sold on it. I do like the initiative 34. That is pretty solid. Uh, move to create a water token is perfectly fine. It's 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 perfectly acceptable. It kind of becomes a little bit rotational, but 
Uh, just due to the what's in your toolkit, I'd say most builds are going to just bring this anyway for low levels. It's pretty easy to rotate out once you get some of the better water generation and better initiatives in later anyways. So it's not really a huge loss. The controller build kind of likes this, but I'm not sure like the striker or defender end up using it as much. Mighty Claws! Um, Attack two, target two, which is perfectly fine, especially if you're targeting two things. It's it's fine, but um, it's especially strong if you're fighting shielded enemies and have dark, and it's very easy for you to get dark. So um, uh, with that, it's uh, with dark, it's attack two, target two, pierce two, one experience, which is definitely ahead of the curve in terms of this. Also, because you have other ways to buff your attacks, it usually ends up being. Uh, more powerful than that, but that's very strong. Obviously, we like that attack for multi-targeting. The bottom of Mighty Claws is... <sighs> it's something I would like because I think it pairs really well. A big burst of movement, great. It's a, it's a loss effect, but uh, Shield 1 and Retaliate 1, which can give you a huge amount of defensive burst, but it's a loss. So... Yeah. that it, It's really hard to justify this kind of action on a loss, except for it can maybe pay off in short scenarios or if you're like later in the scenario, perfectly fine with it, like burning it later once you're having to resort to the other attack actions on top. So uh, potentially you might just use this as a thing to burn out, but the initiative, much better. Um, obviously it's not the greatest, but um, notably better than some of the other Crashing Tide cards. So you bring it for the initiative and the pretty solid double attack that Hopefully you can end up you know, using. Submerge! Pierce 4? We love that! Again, you don't really have problems dealing with shielded enemies, but this is one of them. But it, it's very easy to set this up because, like I said, you know, like the crashing surge that we were talking about, like I said, I'm not like super fond of it, but you can very easily pair it with Submerge. Here, have some water. Now you're standing in water. I have attack, I have advantage because you're standing in water. Also, um, this card gets plus 2 attack while you're standing in water, so enjoy an attack 3 pierce four poison with advantage which is way too strong for a level one card now of course if they don't have shield you're like well attack three poison's not super great so again against shielded enemies very strong against other enemies it's perfectly fine uh the toolkit kind of is pretty lacking in attack so um just getting an attack three with that's fairly easy to set up isn't as bad the bottom ends up being a move two or move three with dark uh where you can potentially get cool movements from um uh, moving through water, um, which sounded really cool in theory, but it usually ended up being not often more than like a move three or four because it's harder to like get a crap ton of water tiles and spaces that you specifically need to use with this to move through stuff. It, the, it was fine. This card's a perfectly fine thing. It's a very good matchup against uh, shielded enemies, so you bring it for that and um, it's pretty rotational once you start leveling up and start getting some better, less conditional attacks. Rising Flood, top tier controller card, you drop a double uh, water hex. The water hex must be adjacent to you on one, and both hexes must be featureless. And then if you do drop um, water on them, uh, they suffer one damage and get immobilized. So the cool part about this is is um, if you need to move out, or if you have you know, skitter or something, you can always move up, drop them in water, attack them potentially with advantage or other things like, you know, submerge. Um, or like you can do the attack thing, move out. You can, uh, especially because you immobilize them. So you can potentially say, hey, melee enemy, I'm gonna go whale on you. Now you're on water, I get a bonus because you're in water. You're immobilized and take one damage. I'm moving out. Now you kind of effectively skip your turn because there's a lot of cards on melee enemies where immobilize effectively says that if you're, there's no nothing else next to them, you can deal with it. That's more of a controller pick because if you're like a defender, you're probably using more of your things on heals and shields, and you might want to stick close to enemies, especially once you get to level four. Um, so it's not going to be as great for the defender build, but it is still pretty good for control, and as well as if you do want to hit and run, like maybe the striker build ends up being pretty strong for that as well. The bottom is actually something I also really like because it's a move three, which is already really good. And it also allows you to move a water tile. So you move one, do a move three, and then pitch the water to another spot. Um, remember what I was saying about like using water placement as like to, to dodge things and get effective disarms? This could be a way to move up closer, put water in between you and some other enemy's path to potentially make sure that that path can't actually hit you this round. Like maybe it'll buy you one round, but buying a round is pretty good. It usually ends up being more better in like two-player um where you, the, it's not as crowded 
um, otherwise we found that like moving water from one to one and making sure it's still featureless and still blocks paths and still isn't interfering with another player ended up being a little bit more conditional, but um, it still has a lot of uses and the controller obviously loves this card. Undertow. Hey, Alice, you said the initiatives suck. Yeah, mostly. So we get excited over this. 15. That's like, that's like the goal. I mean, the goal's 14, but like mo most of the time, if you have 14 and under, that's good. So 15 undercuts, most of the cards that you really want to do to make sure that you go early. Now, most of them, I know they're still really annoying. Anyway, we're not going to get too hung up on that. Good initiative is the point. Um, ignoring the top, the... It's a heal oneself, which is really good, if, especially if you're, like, um, dealing with those poison enemies. Because, like like I said, cleansing swell, very annoying, but this is an easy way to pop up any negative conditions and then add a shield. Shield on an initiative 15 is great. So if you have, like, sharp chitin in play, boom, two shields. Like, that. that's really strong. Now, of course, this one's not a tight, so it's shield for one round. But, hey, initiative 15, shield self. And then with it, just a heal one to give you a little bit of survivability is really great. But let's talk about the top. This is almost like a kill card, not really, but um, um, pick a normal or an elite enemy in water, lose this card, gain two get experience, and just give them a free bane. Um, this one, depending on the scenario, like there are certain enemies where who like if they have like really annoying things. I'm thinking of like like ice wraiths or something like that where. Um, if you can see, like, let's say you're going at initiative 15, which beats, like, all of their cards except for one. Yeah, they have that 13. That's really annoying. Um, like, if you have a lot of ice rates until they hit level 4 or something like that, end up having, like, 10 health. So you could always say, hey, that's ice rates are really annoying. Please enjoy this bane. Uh, go before them to make sure make sure they're not doing one of their heal one self cards because they have a few of those. Um, but if you if you see they're doing that, just say, here, enjoy this. Stand in water, get baned, and then watch them just die. That adds up really quickly and could be a really good use for a thing. Just straight up deleting an elite enemy that's going to be very annoying can sometimes pay off more of the scenario and is worth the stand with. Um, even if you hold on to this till later, it's still strong. So you're going to be using the initiative for the 15. You can potentially use it for shield. And then it's a situational kill. We bring Undertow for a lot. Good card. Also a great song. Love Pain of Salvation. Remedy Lane is such a great album. It's very depressing, though. Stephanie's going to edit this out, so it's okay. Crush Armor! So this is an X card that is an X card. This is a card they love. It's great. It's amazing. Situationally. Um, so that's the really, really, this is the really cool part I like about X cards, because this one basically says, like, this, remember how I'm like, man, this is, class is so good against living spirits and living spirits and flame demons. I said living spirits twice. That's cool. Um, this is straight up delete so many living spirits. Just one shot. No draw necessary. Delete living spirit, gain an experience. And it does this to also flame demons too for a while. Depends. Like, I think it's level three flame demons that are elite. It drops them to one. Anyway, whole point is, I don't have the whole thing memorized, but I have a lot of it. Anyway, whole point is, is this just murders those. It's great. Not not conditional, just chomp. <laughs> Give them the middle finger, laugh at them. Crush their armor. Um, yeah. Um, but against enemies that are like high health, high shield, which is really just steel automatons, it's not as good. So bring it in the scenario. It's still it's still strong because it's that's still that's still gonna be good because you can at least pitch this as a um, <clears throat> like three damage thing or four depending. Also, if they have that really annoying ability where they get the mega shield, look how high it's attack. Trap. Like I have shield seven this round. Just sorry, it's suffer seven. Obviously, it's very hard to reliably juggle that, but we've we've seen it pay off like once. Anyway, the whole point is is this is a really situationally very strong card against those enemies, and the bottom is kind of slightly the opposite, like where it's um really good against enemies that don't have big shields. But you do see stuff like, you know, um, oozes or forest imps or living bones or frozen corpses that have just one shield where if you're like, aha, I've got pierce four on this attack and like, um, you're like, that's great. But the 
fours of like the, the attack gets weighted because it's like hey you have a lot of pierce but the attack isn't there this saying like hey everything next to me gets minus one shield ends up adding a lot more when you're fighting those enemies where you can do a crap ton of attacks on an enemy especially with like you know rancid brine by like hey i'm gonna poison them and do um rapid attacks on them and dropping the one shield ends up adding up to a lot so um if you're fighting several enemies that have one shield the bottom's good if you're fighting enemies that have high shield the top's good and if the scenario has no shield this card is trash and that's okay because in these scenarios where this happens you, this is a card you rotate in and that's perfectly fine and then you rotate out if you don't we love those for x cards the builds all right i could go like through all these 12 cards to talk about them but i'm just gonna because 12 12 12 for these three builds instead i'm just gonna say hey you're all gonna be picking some of the same kind of cards and this isn't your default hand it's kind of it's it's the base that you use and adapt to your allies and your scenarios so the defender picks everything except for crush armor power pool and rising flood again as a default hand um bring you're obviously going to bring crush armor to any scenarios you need it so but we're going to default move those out and like i said the cards i said that were lower priority you're going to like um soft flesh is pretty rotational you'll can potentially use that if you need to get crush armor in uh, striker picks everything except crush armor rising flood and soft flesh and the controller picks everything except for a soft flesh crush armor and power pool so that's the general gist i know it's like i know i really hyped up crush armor but again this is just your sideboard cards you should use all the cards except for like pool of power i'm not as fond of and soft flesh so it's th those are like the only two i'm like really not a big fan of for situations but like who knows uh, I know someone in the comments is going to be like, hey girl, you're wrong. I used pull of power and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's, that, that's, that's great. I'm sure, I'm sure some people have used it to great effect and make your own guide. Anyway, let's move on to like level two cards, Smashing Torrent versus Blood in the Water. I love both of these cards. Um, I think I kind of lean a little bit towards Blood in the Water a little bit, but Smashing Torrent is part of the, um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about this basically murder the boss builds later. Um, I did actually start doing this, and but I didn't. Um, we didn't actually get to use it uh, outside of playtesting. Uh, but we did find I did find a post, and I'm going to talk about this in the overview later once we get past the, the level nine cards. Where smashing torrent is key for the. Um, I think he ended up doing 160 damage. I don't feel like scrolling through the document and seeing what it is, but it was. Uh, a huge amount of damage, and this was one of the core cards part of it. But this also has a stun on it. Let's just start talking about I'm going to talk about the cards instead of concepts. Smashing Torrent. Definitely one of the cards that, if you have the element or don't have the element, makes or breaks the card. Attack 2 is weaker than all of your things. But if you have light, stun the enemy and get an experience. Yeah, <laughs> adding stun and an experience drastically changes the power of basically any card so with light boom stun an enemy attack two and um this actually really in my opinion ramps up once you hit level three do you see this troublemaker her name is misha she's beautiful and cute and soft and causes so much chaos we love her so much once you get to level three and you have shuck Attack 2, Pierce 2, Stun Wound is really strong just because of how Wound and Stun pair with each other very well. Um, so we obviously go for that, but um, the bottom actually ends up being pretty strong because it says, you know, once per turn when you take a move action, uh, one adjacent enemy suffers one damage. So this allows you to chip away. This is also especially strong against those enemies that do like have shield where you can keep chipping away at them or just adding extra chip damage to turn your bottoms because you have to do two tops. You could potentially attack, attack, and then a bottom, which may not be an attack. You don't have a lot of bottom attacks, but you could potentially turn that into a move and then suffer one damage, which can, you can kind of maybe use to reposition and start to chip away at the enemy health. So, no, there's some really good uses for this card. Personally, I do love Smashing Torrent. Um, but Blood in the Water is pretty great. Blood on the Water. initiative. Is, the initiative is balls, but, like, you know, what's new? Um, the, the phrasing is really interesting because it's, you place a two water hex tile and one must be adjacent to you, but because that you can actually place it to where you are underneath it. And there, you have several cards that say, if you are in water, then blank. But so many of the cards that place water say in an adjacent hex, and you'll later have to move into that hex 
This one just allows you to straight up drop it on yourself. So you could potentially say, hey, um, I'm gonna drop this water, um, maybe get annoying, annoy that enemy over there, so screw with their path. Now, now I have an advantage on all my crabby attacks this round. So really strong card. Also, the top is just really synergizes well with itself. It is, of course, a loss effect, but it does have some pretty powerful stuff. It gives you a nice move to start off with, and then a pull, and then you get an attack which gets boosted if they're in water. The cool part is though, if you do have water, which you have several ways to drop it, the move allows you to position yourself to bring the pull, which is a pull too, um, the, the, to position yourself at the correct angle to where whatever you're trying to do, get on the other side of the water and make sure that the water's in front of you, pull them into that water so the attack four just becomes an attack six wound. Attack six wound, so the short version is this is a pull that basically turns into an attack six wound plus whatever other tied active effects you have, um, which is usually not too much for offensive purposes at this level. It might also be a poison or whatnot, but the whole point ended up being is this is a pretty strong of loss effect that I consider to be worth it. And the bottom is very good just because of how to use zone stuff out. Personally, I do like both of these cards. I do think Blood in the Water has some potential to generally be more useful, especially because of how much you like rely on certain water things. But if you're not going for the water, that's just obviously a non-pick. Controller obviously picks Blood in the Water and Defender picks Smashing Torrent because it's hard to turn down that stun. Uh, Striker could go either way. If you are going for the boss killer build, uh, depending on what level you are, because that really largely only plays into effect once you get to level five and later really level six, but get to that point. If you are going for the boss killer build, which is not a boss killer build at level two, I think it only starts triggering at about level five through seven. But if you are going for that, you do need Smashing Torrent to really add in that extra punch to it. Um, uh, to have a certain amount of tides in play to trigger with um, Shuck and Tidal Force, so on and so forth, you know, all those things. So um, uh, you go for Smashing Torrent in that case, but I do think Striker probably goes for Blood in the Water regardless, because that big burst of damage and being able to um, more reliably get water so you have advantage all the time uh, is just too much of a boon that I'd say I, I would not fault you for picking Smashing Torrent. But Blood on the Water is also really strong, so 50-50 there, but um, uh, yeah, like I said, Defender picks Smashing Torrent, and Controller obviously picks Blood in the Water. Level 3, Shuck! Yeah! Alright, so this one's great. All of your attacks have Pierce 2 and Wound. That's a good tie. That's damage right there. That, like I said, pairs really well. If you picked Smashing Torrent, you're probably going to go for Shuck just for that, because that's just a really good combo. Um, not necessary, but that's just a really good straight up that's a good tide. Um, if you need damage, that's it. Uh, the bottom effect of Shuck is um, move one, attack one, repeat this equal to the amount of tides you have. So if you have like six tides in play, that can add up to a lot. Um, but, and if you have an element, you know, it's move two, attack one. But like I said, smashing torrent, you like move one, make them suffer a damage, and then that's it. Like, it would be great if Smashing Torrent could trigger multiple times per round. And there is a card that allows you to do that later, um, which we'll get to that when we get there. But um, the top of Shuck is very good just for the um, brain stop. The top of Shuck is just good for persistent damage, especially if you're dealing with shielded enemies, which, again, your toolkit's loaded with that. But this effectively kind of removes some of those, like, well, if I have... The, yeah, this, this one brings just all the anti-shield, um, so Shuck's really strong. Um, and the bottom is required, a requ and very incredibly thousand percent necessary part of the boss killer build. It's actually the attack that's going to basically kill enemies. <clears throat> However, on the other side of Shuck is Endless Cycle. Um, great album too, Love After Pain. Um, but look at that. Do you see it? Do you see it? I see it. Init 8. Initiative 8. There are so many classes where Initiative 8, you'd go like, oh, but especially on the Tide, you go, this is exciting. I wanted I wanted an Initiative Sub 14. You got it. You Also, you beat the 10, too. You got, this is an 8. That's exciting. So, full stop. Init 8, move 3. It's really all you need to know to really say. If, if, I, if you said, hey, I took this card for the Init 8, move 3, I'd say... I don't fault you at all. That's a good decision. It doesn't really matter 
that the rest, the rest of the card says, that's good enough to justify it. Of course, some people are like, well, you just hyped up Shuck. Yeah, it's a great card, but move three initiate on this toolkit is really strong. However, it does more than just that. If you do have water, which is very easy for several builds to build up, you also get a bonus shield one. This does add up really well. First off, shield on an initiate, obviously good. It does stack really well with itself. So if you do very easily, the funny part is if you could, I don't like using it with um, undertow because you're like, haha, you can easily get shield three, but then you're pitching two of your early initiative undercuts on the same round, which is something you probably don't want to be doing, but hey, I'm not you, you're not me. We're different people. Probably. I don't know. Sometimes in my... Nope, 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 nope. We're not going there. A conditional shield, move three, initiate is a really good card. The top is actually a really interesting, like, stam potion where you can, based off the amount of tides you have play, you can scoop some cards back. But you're like, wow, this could be, like, really good when you have six tides in play. Yeah, if you play have six tides in play and drop this, uh, you'll buy yourself a couple more turns, and then when you rest, like, you lost this, lost this, and your hand size is down to ten. Suddenly you find out that... Yeah, you did buy some time, but then you lost your initiate really early on, and now your the rest of your rest cycles are shorter. So although it does seem really strong, you pitched one of your um, three card turns, turned it into a two card turn because that's effectively a, like a dead action just a setup that uh, didn't buy you so much. So you're probably going to be using it later in the scenario, which is still pretty good when you're like like just getting to the setup and then you're resting again just getting in there so buying like a buying one to two turns after like you're later in the scenario adds up to way more than it is early in the scenario so um we obviously that that's still a very strong thing it's conditional but in those conditions i obviously like the top of endless cycle it's 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 a good card striker goes for shock for obvious reasons and all other builds go for endless cycle if striker it if you're a striker and just wanted the initiate, I wouldn't fault you for that either, but I do think Shuck is the way to go for damage. Level four, Chaotic Refraction. This one's a fun one. Um, retaliate to Tide. Just straight up, let's look at that. Retaliate to. That's great. Because you're already probably taking several hits. You're finding ways to heal yourself. You're recovering from that. You're like, hey, I've got all these shield effects. Cool. That's awesome. But also, against melee attacks, you get a plus one shield too. So a sharp chitin, this very easily becomes like move two. <laughs> move two, retaliate two. You love to see it. Yeah. Um, we love this card. This is just become the become the unkillable crab. Watch it as the enemies like try to attack you. Um, they don't do that much damage and constantly just bounce crabby spiny damage back. <laughs> Die. We love it. We, we love this card. It's, gosh, it's so fun. The bottom is definitely an effect. It's like move, it's like move and loot, which normally be exciting. Whatever. Just look at the top. That's what you're using this card. Like, don't, don't, don't get any fancy ideas. You're bringing it for the top. Clean sweep. So, like, uh, for a level card on, like, level four card on some classes, this might be considered, like, pretty weak. Attack two on all adjacent enemies, potentially model. But, like, you know, with, like, potentially Rancid Bride and Shuck in play, you're like, oh, no, like, this is just a couple of attack twos. But then when you turn this into, well, this is an attack two, pierce two, wound, poison, muddle, all adjacent enemies, you're like, oh, whoa, whoa, that added up really fast. Of course, that's for, like, the striker build to do, but that's still pretty great. And we love that. So, um... Yeah, that's that's just a really strong AoE if you're getting into there for the striker build. Um, the bottom is actually a really good recovery card because it's like a move one and then a heal two or heal four. Now you're like, that's really good for like um, not having to wait to get that heal four, like cleansing swell. You have to wait for that. And um, uh, cleansing swell also gives you an element and this one takes away an element. But still, an immediate heal four is really strong. So um, heal four, get an experience is really great. However... Um, yeah, it really depends on if you're going to be taking hits or not because chaotic refraction, re chaotic refraction obviously wins out in terms of like durability and tankiness because that's the retaliate built in is just really good. The defender obviously goes for chaotic refraction because obvious reasons, and striker goes for clean sweep because the top attack is strong. Um, controller goes for clean sweep if you really want to go for that, but I wouldn't. I could see the def the controller kind of going for. Uh, chaotic refraction if you're kind of a, doing a little bit tanky so you go for whatever suits your party's need for this one level five tidal blast <laughs> you know, this is another one of those fun ones that we're going to find out later why it's so fun uh tidal blast blast big ranged attack so it's not really that big it's attack three range four 
and target a number of en enemies within range equal to your active tides. Obviously, it's a loss, so you're not like, wow, that's just a lot of damage. Just for this yeah, it's a loss effect. Of course it is. But if you have, like, five tides in play, do uh, five, attack three, range four with whatever other benefit you have. That can add up to so much burst damage, um, which is fine. Um, it's a pretty good loss, I personal. It, it becomes more interesting later once we get to some of the high-level cards. Um, which we'll get to in a second, specifically I'm thinking of like Low Tide, but um, which is a level 9 card. <sighs> Mirabelle's so annoying. Um, but yeah, I was also reminded, like, just Tidal Blast from these things. I'm imagining the lobsters from Elden Ring in the um, in, in front of the Academy. Gosh, that was so annoying. I hated it so much. Love that game. That game's fantastic. Um, hated those lobsters. I know there's a difference between lobsters and crabs. I know the difference between lobsters and crabs, but there are lobsters in Elden Ring. They're crab here. Anyway, similar effect. Uh, the tide, on the other hand, is really wonderful. Plus, two, one, plus one to one attack and one move every round, which is great because that effectively adds a little bit of maneuverability every round and adds one damage every round. One damage every round is very big. We like it. Obviously, being a tide, it also generates an element. Is there something you wanted to add, Mirabelle? Is there something you wanted to add? Right, go cool. on. I do really love these kittens. They're just really annoying when they're trying to interrupt. Anyway, Tidal Blast Bottom ends up being pretty decent. It's a good striker ability. It ends up, again, for reasons we'll talk about in a later thing, being a cork part of why we have the boss killer build later. Yeah, so Sodden Soil, hey, Initiative 17. There's another good one. Obviously, that's really hard to bitch about, so we love that. Um, so yeah, Initiative 17, we did it, read it. Um, but then you actually have a non-conditional top. This top, is it's really weird because you have so many cards that are like, well, if you have dark, if you have light, if they're in water, just to see a very refreshing attack three, a mobilized wound, one experience. You're like, is, did this get put on the wrong class? No, you finally just have a generic attack that's really strong. That's it. Uh, tied to an initiative 17. Like, that's just... That's just really good. Obviously, with, like, Skitter and other things, it's very easy to, like, move in, mobilize, and then maybe, like, move out and start to do something like laugh at this enemy that's now wounded and immobilized over there. Ha 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 Eat shit. Um... But yeah, no, it's it's pretty strong. Uh, and here's the funny part that we like about this with um, like tank builds, because um, maybe you want to skitter away, but when you have melee retaliate and shield one against, you know, when you have melee retaliate and then you watch enemies like move away, you're like, oh man, chaotic refraction really suck. But if you like immobilize them and say, haha, now you and you take some damage. Also, you're wounded. Also, you're immobilized. So now you're going to attack me with disadvantage. Also, suffer two from retaliate. That ends up being really strong just to thwart ranged enemies. So obviously Defender Crab loves that. The the bottom's really weird for a loss because it's teleport five or teleport unlimited with the correct element. And, um, but you have to teleport into water and then you do an attack two on everything next to you, which is a big teleport with an attack two is great, but you have to teleport into water. There have, there have to be enemies adjacent to those hexes to the point where you want to attack them. It's fine. I mean, there's conditions where it's certainly useful. And also there's certain scenarios where teleporting to any water hex is busted. So in those scenarios, it's really strong. Luckily, it's tied to a very good initiative with an attack that's so universally useful, it's hard to complain about. So obviously, Sodden Soil is a very strong pick. All builds pick Sodden Soil, period. Except if you're going for more of a sustained damage, Tidal Surge can be good. And if you're going for the boss killer, you have to take Tidal Blast. I may have said Tidal Surge earlier, Tidal Blast. Um, strikers obviously could go either way, but um, if you're going Boss Killer, you must take Tidal Blast because that's part of the thing that breaks a shuck later. We'll get to that card in a minute, but um, yeah. Sodden Soil for everyone, potentially Tidal Blast if that's what you're going for. Level six, Powerful Pincer versus Twilight Grasp. Uh, both of these are kind of, they're good cards, but let's talk, first talk about Powerful Pincer. The Claw is the Law. Um, also good song. Stephanie does not like it. All right, the claw is the law. Um, once per turn, when you perform an attack, consume both dark and light to disarm the enemy. It actually really changes uh, how you end up playing, to be fair, uh, because a lot of times you're trying to use these elements to like combo them to change positioning, to add up more damage, and so on and so forth. And then it now turns into 
Um, now you're using this just to disarm every round. You're going to want to drop two tides to get the elements and then disarm two tides. Well, but that's too many tides. So as a result, you're going to need some either elemental support from like items, obviously, of like element potion as an option. And so or like depending on what other items you have unlocked, if you have element support, this ends up being really good. But other than that, generating the necessary elements to do this reliably means you're going to be playing two tides, disarm, two tides, disarm. And it's too many actions spent on generating tides and not enough for effect. So sometimes it almost feels like it's not worth it but if you have the extra generation it ends up being really strong obviously powerful pincher is really screened the bottom is really good though because you can move and then you use light to immobilize everything next to you again really good with chaotic refraction because you can also chaotic refraction straight up infuses light for you so you can use it to spend the light like hello um hello all these ranged enemies i'm going to skitter in front of your face now well not literally skitter you're gonna you know, powerful pincer in front of their face, then immobilize them, now force them to attack you. Um, they'll suffer the um, their melee retaliate, or they'll suffer their retaliate too, and they'll have disadvantage and they're not moving away from you on the turn. Really strong. We, we love the bottom for that reason. Uh, Twilight Grasp is a lot of damage. It's like a weird, weird cleave where you're missing that middle. It's like two claws out in this attack three but if you have dark it's attack four if you have light it's an attack four if you have both it's an attack five it's not that hard to actually get two attack fives with this but even like in scenarios where you only have one of them two attack fours with one experience is really strong so um the damage on twilight grasp is also just straight up i don't think it's difficult to get a single attack five on this and plus whatever bonuses you have for your thing so um, it's comparable to like what I was talking about with Cresting Force, which is a level one card. But this one has the, the like the bare minimum is like you do an attack four and attack five plus bonuses. Um, the, the highest is you like two attack fives plus rolling for plus uh, attack modifiers. Like if you're if you're in water in advantage, this the potential here is really huge. So we like this for its potential, but also it's really not that hard to use to begin with. Um, the initiative 33 is fine, but the, also the movement on this, move two and then you have to lose it, but you can bane up to two enemies that are in water. Two banes is nice, but the fact that the top is generally really easy to use in terms of like the floor, like, like I said, it's really not that, it's, it's really not that bad. It's generally used universally useful and you'll occasionally get, you're not going to get the dual attack five reliably. But you'll get some of them more often. It's not that hard. And then it's tied to a loss where you could potentially bane two people, which is obviously super strong. Twilight Grasp for Strikers and Powerful Pincer for Defenders and Controllers. But if you do find Powerful Pincer a little bit too difficult to play around to do that disarm, the bottom's still fine. Or you could always go for Twilight Grasp, which is not necessary. Which all the builds don't hurt from getting bonus damage. There's... There's a cat right here, isn't there? Level seven, dug in. Attack three on all adjacent enemies. Pretty strong, we like it. Um, but just attack three on everything. Then if you burn dark, you're immune to forced movement, which is situationally overpowered to most of the time useless. Yeah. Seriously, most scenarios that's not gonna be useful. But in the scenarios where you do want that, it can actually be huge. Um, there's actually one scenario that I'm thinking of where that can kind of break one of the mechanics of it, which is great. But again, situationally super strong, but even then, the attack three on everything next to you is pretty great. The bottom three is super wonderful, though, because it's just a, did you move this turn? If no, heal three self. So you could potentially have like a triple regen. It does require you to hold still, but holy crap. Uh, so for defender builds, that'll usually spend more of their actions. Like, let's do a bottom action for a tide, some two top things for either potentially like shield or put another tide in or do some attacks. Um, and just watch as you just heal three, heal three, heal three. It adds up to a lot real fast. Yeah, it's a good tide. That's a really strong tide. Obviously for like the maneuverability in and out, that's the strategy doesn't synergize well with that. So you're going to have to learn to like, I'm going to drop some water there, sit on it, make enemies attack me. Yeah. Um, that this this adds up even then if it like adds up to three heal threes over a rest cycle that's really good level seven drown beneath the waves um that sounds pretty metal 
Um, we take that. Um, also, initiative nine, fairly metal, and initiative nine. We love that. Obviously, metal, like, card names don't actually make or break. We'll move on. Initiative nine's great. So, first thing we're going to do is talk about the bottom. Uh, you pull the, you pull an enemy. Yay! You just do a pull two on up to three enemies within range five, and you don't have to pull them all um, the full distance, but then uh, three pulls is nice. Um, this is really good if you need things to get in melee with you to begin with. And then every enemy in water within five hexes of you suffers two damage. That on an initiative nine is just really strong. But the top, that loss, this is where the boss killer thing comes into play. Gives you a nice move and an attack and a move. Which is not that great for a level 7 loss, but it also says Smashing Torrent and Tidal Blast no longer are restricted to one action per turn. So that means for the rest of the round, if you have Smashing Torrent in play, every move also inflicts one damage. It also says that um, if you have Tidal Blast in play, every move gets um, plus one, and every attack gets plus one. So what this means is... If you have eight tides in play, of which two of them are um, Tidal Blast and Smashing Torrent, that means the bottom of Shuck, if you play it after Drown Beneath the Waves, this is eight tides, which is hard to get into play. It's not hard, but you're going to spend a lot of setup to build up to this. But that means is um, you're going to be performing eight, um, move three, suffer one damage, Eight, move three, an adjacent enemy suffers one damage, and then eight attack twos. If you're on water, that's going to be eight attack twos with advantage, to which some people are like, well, those are only attack twos. That's not that great. Of course, with one of those tides being poison, they're probably going to be turning into attack threes, and this is where you start to do power potions. So like with a major power potion, that those are now quickly all into eight attack fives, and now all of a sudden you're like, oh no, no, this is phenomenally skyrocketing. So getting like um, all the suffer damage and stuff, this is where we start to talk about the, the, the boss killer, because you dump everything into this, build up a crap ton of tides, and you're like, oh no, but the boss, this is just kill the boss. You're just murder them. I don't know what that was. Um, yeah, so that's that's the boss killer. Drown Beneath the Waves is the boss killer. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll go into more detail on that once we get to strategy. Um, Defender Pigs picks dug in because it is, in fact, unkillable crab o'clock. And all other builds pick drown beneath the waves for obvious reasons death on all sides it's scoundrel but it's um crab form plus two to all your attacks remember when i was talking about the boss killer thing where you could do like uh 10 attacks in that round or something like that imagine if all those attacks have plus two this is it haha <laughs> of course you need an, an ally next oh no i need an ally next to the boss i'm about to kill small ask small ask also, depending on your group, this one can add up to just a lot of damage because plus two on all your attacks next to allies. Oh no, it's not that big of an ask, and that can add up to a lot over the course of the scenario. Obviously, it's insane. The bottom is your only non-loss attack, period, or non-loss bottom attack. This isn't actually as big because, because you're playing two cards per turn, which allows you to play two tops per turn, it's really easy to do two to three attacks per turn to begin with. So this isn't really as big a deal, but it does allow you to have a payoff once you've like dropped everything. You could use two tops for attacks and then this bottom for attack and just do three attacks across the board. So it's pretty strong, but um, this, this card's fine um, just for that as is, but the top is also another source of damage. So, I mean, it's a fine card. I'm not complaining about it, but this card's really good. But like, I, I normally get way more excited over bottom attacks on other classes than I do the Crashing Tide. Still strong. Ebb and flow. Hey, we love this card, and the initiative's good, which, again, you don't have to pick every time I say the initiative's good. You don't have to pick it, but pick some of them, please. The The funny part is the, the, it combos so well with itself. So pick everything within range four, pull it all, and you can pull exactly where you want to. Then you perform an attack against all of them, depending on which um, 
uh, uh, which uh, tides you have in play, this attack could be really um, have other cool effects, especially if you have shock in play to wound them all. So then, then you push and immobilize all of them. The funny part about this is, is this allows you to push in the correct order. If there's traps or hazards, this can do a lot of damage. But then pull everything to where you can do this big cleave is huge, because a lot of those like attack everything adjacent ends up being. Um, like harder to do because you need enemies to be closer. But this allows you to pull them to you, and then once you knock them away and immobilize them, they're now further away from you and immobilized. So this screws over a lot of rain or a lot of melee enemies. It screws over a lot of melee enemies. Um, like I said, with the mobilize that actually or with um with shock for the wound ends up adding a lot more damage because they're gonna be chilling over there for a round, suffering a wound, uh, damage from that. And then the next round they're gonna suffer a wound. Just to, I mean, and it almost ends up acting like a stun, so that's why I'm really on the the wound on Shuck on this. So, um, Ebon Flow is really strong. The uh, move three, heal three on bottom is a really strong action, but you can drop water on yourself with this too. Remember how I got excited over that at level two? So non-loss, like move three, heal three, potentially drop water, and you can put it on yourself is just a really strong action. It ends up being really good. Defender and controller pick ebb and flow. Striker picks death on all sides, I think, for very obvious reasons. Level 9! High tide and low tide. <laughs> hey, we've got the theme going, guys. Um, um, so high tide is just move equal to the number of tides you have in play. Attack equal to the number of tides you have in play. Obviously, since I said, hey, cresting force is um, good up until level 9. High tide's top is good at level 9. This is... It's a good card. It's really hard to complain about that. The initiative 90 is also really good if you need to go late. Um, it usually ends up being like a move 5, attack 5, or move 5, six, move 6, attack 6 with whatever bonuses, um, which is great. But um, that's usually all ends up being off the payoff turn. But if you have like 6 tides in play and then use the last 2 to cresting force high tide, you could do move 6, attack 6, attack 6, plus your other passive bonus bonuses. And I don't think most people go, oh no, move 6, attack 6, attack 6, whatever would we do? That's, that's good. So, yeah, high tide's a good pick. Uh, the bottom is... Um, harder to use than I want it to be because you have to the problem here is you, you can't long rest uh, saying to like having this effect in play without that obviously would be too strong if you couldn't but um, you for the rest of the scenario you're only short resting but you can keep those tides in play holy crap that's huge that said for like certain scenarios like boss fights or Marcel scenarios the bottom of high tide obviously is a, definitely worth it because resetting is really annoying the top's still useful anyway. Low Tide, Inish 10, that's what we want. Um, get two cards of your loss pile and play them for the loss actions. It's interesting because a lot of your tides don't have losses on the other side, but you do have Tidal Blast. So this could be some way to, like, um, you run in there, burn all your tides, um, and then, like, long rest. Um, and use... Um, Tidal Blast for a big burst in the first room. So you're like, aha, to look at all the damage I did, and then use Low Tide to like do Overwhelming Wave. Like You're going to lose, lose Overwhelming Wave on your Long Rest. And then you already burned Tidal Blast. Now we use the Low Tide to make Overwhelming Wave and Tidal Blast in play forever. You also lose Low Tide in the process. But that means that now these two cards no longer uh, reset when you, um, when you rest, which is huge. That's game changing. Now you could also use this with like um, trying to lose cards to um, whatever and get your shield cards in play too. But uh, the problem is you, you can't like deliberately lose the shield cards unless you're like pitching it for damage, which I don't think is necessarily worth it. Or um, you have to like rest. Anyway, the whole point is, is it ends up working really well with Tidal Blast because it's on the other half of a loss. But the point here being is um, this kind of changed the value of when you want to lose things because you could potentially keep this as a buff to like not lose these two tights. Of course, it really does hurt your uh, stamina a bit, but at the same time, having fewer turns that are dead turns are way too good and it's way too hard to pass up. So we love it. The bottom of low tide is basically what you want as a defender. Um, not only do you get a shield to self for a round, which is really good, especially with all your other tides. Uh, the bigger problem though is you have to drop this before your third tide, which means usually in the first couple rounds following a rest. But that can actually be really good. Mostly because the fact it gives you an initiative 10, shield two plus a move four. 
Mobility is a big problem for this class, so being able to move into position, go really early, and shield up, but you can always just stack on tides after you uh, get the shield benefit, to the point where I don't think it's necessarily a downside. So it does everything that you particularly want there. Uh, the only problem being, like, obviously the top is something that you might want to consider uh, playing anyway, so you might not get too many uses out of the bottom, but a good initiative with a good move and a strong shield for a round really is super cumulative, especially if Chaotic Refraction up, basically giving you shield 3, retaliate 2, which is plus your items, plus anything else you can have. This really gets to the point where you get really out of control real fast. So gives you one round of an amazing thing. So I'd say obviously the Defender goes with it, but a lot of other builds are definitely going to lean on that top ability as well. Although, to be fair, most builds can't hurt from having a shield for a round. Although, you know, the top of high tides damage is very strong. Perks. So the perk order is going to change a little bit depending on what you're going for, but I think everyone goes for the uh, impair immune and ignore uh, the penalties for items. Obviously, that's a pretty easy pick because you do want to get some armor. And um, I think the, the long rest perk is actually really valuable if you're up on the front line. There's, there's a lot of times when over the course of a scenario where you can... You're probably not going to draw your attack modifier modifications that you make every scenario. So you might draw it zero, maybe one or two times if you're lucky. So having an on-command trigger for... Um, shield one reliably that stacks with your other bonuses is huge so I personally think this is more valuable than some of the shield perks so uh, like the sh like rolling shield or stuff like that it's or anyway this one adds up to more I consider these the first two to go with um, to continue talking about the cards the obviously the attack with advantage in water is really strong but this is something I'd say if you're building the character off the bat and like you're starting at high levels and have retired some already, you pick this to start. It just makes it easier and you don't need to worry about it. But it's kind of really annoying if you're trying to like build up one, two, three check marks. So you could wait if you wanted to, to like during those times where you get a perk and then also leveled up at the same time from check marks, get two. So the gap between like what you're doing doesn't make up as much. It also depends on what level and how much water regen you're playing. Because if you're not doing a lot of water generation, then maybe you're not going to. But like permanent advantage while you're on the water ends up adding to way more over the scenario than even it, it's worth the three easily. But we, we, we have an asterisk next to it where depending on your build and blah, blah, it may not be as high a priority as others and it really depends on like your group because if you're going no water ob like you're like hey my group's really cluttered i don't want to drop water then obviously this is something that might not interest you but um if you are going for like the water build and other stuff like that this is obviously a high priority that said we're gonna go through the other perks um here's the funny part i hate rolling pierce but rolling pierce that replaces negative ones um just removing terminal cards, removing terminal negative ones is really big. We love it. We love it. This card ends up being the highest priority as a result of that. Um, removing the um, minus ones for plus zero target can be better than the rolling pierces, but um, the plus zero is a terminal, and then you also have to have another target within range, plus you already have a lot of these cleaves, so you're not going to cleave the target again to the point where... I guess what I'm trying to say is that... Um, the plus zero target is just harder to use, but it does replace a minus one, so it's a really easy pick. It's not quite as good as the minus one to plus one, but there's going to be scenarios where you draw this and it ends up better. But I'd say more often than not, the plus one will be better, but that's okay. It also depends if you're in four player and there's more enemies, the, the plus one target ends up being good. But the, the rolling pierce is good. However, also you can now replace zeros with rolling plus one damage and shield one which that's really good because getting rid of the zeros is perfectly fine once you've gotten rid of like the four negatives. But then getting rid of those terminal cards that also give you potentially rolling shield, rolling damage. And because you do have a lot of multi-attacks, it's easier to fish these out. <laughs> fish because he's... Never mind. Anyway, it's easier to draw these cards. So wouldn't worry about it. That's a really strong card. Um, adding the two plus ones, but plus two if they're tied is fine. Like, adding two plus twos is pretty good, but um, it's plus twos with asterisks. I'd say they're plus two more often than not, but 
that's pretty fine. It does fatten the deck a bit, add more terminals, but once you've gotten a lot of the terminals out from the first replacement, that's still pretty strong. Adding the plus two muddle, I'm not as big a fan of, but I do like the plus one disarm because disarming enemies is never going to be something you don't want to do. So add the plus one disarm is a pretty easy pick. But also adding rolling heal oneself is pretty good. You're probably going to want to prioritize these after you've uh, gotten rid of the um, removing the minus ones and my plus zeros. So like I said, the general gist of the strategy is to drop Overwhelming Wave and whatever top tide you want to roll with for the first round and then just do a little bit of setup and spending those elements in the second round. It's pretty easy, like I said, to uh, run right into Skitter. So you can burn both those to do attack two, move one, attack two again. Um, it's, if you need to do damage, um, uh, Rancid Brine is basically your low level damage boost, but you also can, you have Shuck at level three as another damage boost and you have other options later. Um, it really depends on how much defense you're going, but you can start, um, the amount of tides you play, you may not be using all the tides, so use them as you find them like effectively. Like, um, you don't necessarily need to play Rancid Brine every time just to get the poison on all the attacks. Sometimes you're going to just want to toss water under enemies and poison them and then just dump like two attack actions on top of them. You're like, oh no, but like, hey, sometimes that ends up adding up to more damage and you may not need to poison the enemies depending on who else is in your group, but the bottom ends up being pretty strong anyway. So balance, you might you might balance how many tides you actually play each rest cycle. So it's not going to be an attack five, six every time. Maybe it's only going to be like, uh, have three or four tides in there, which is perfectly fine. It depends on what that rest cycle ends up being. So um, just kind of uh, keep that in mind and be open to how much you want to ramp up and how many tides you're going to end up being playing. But I did see... It Tolls For You is the Reddit username who did the thing where it was Drown Beneath the Waves with Shuck and um, I had Skitter, but they already had Smashing Torrent, Tidal, Tid, Tidal Blast, and six other tides in play. So with that set up, it ends up, they ended up with a Brittle on the bus, logged 160 damage. I do think that um, if you dropped Skitter in place of High Tide, that that would have been in a move... Whatever that that have been a move that would have been a move whatever attack twelve suffer one damage that would have added up more than skitter although skitter is two attacks <sighs> yeah actually I think skitter still does win because that would have been was it attack three plus four seven seven yeah f crap no skitter the two attacks wins <laughs> damn that is it's too good uh, but yeah 160 damage to it. And no, it's perfectly fine. You dump a bunch of items like major power, minor power. Um, you, or you dump a bunch of items into it, like power potion, major power. Just dump all those. Make sure you have advantage either from like a potion or make sure you're just in water. That's usually probably what you're doing at this level anyway, because you have enough water generation. So just come up with a way to just dump a bunch of damage. But um, yeah, it's the shock drown beneath the waves, having smashing torrents and tidal blast in play, and six other tides, and just it's. I I, I personally don't think that the. I, I think getting over a hundred is pretty reliable. I think getting over one sixty is probably about your limit. But let's be real here, like casually saying, well, I spent uh, four turns of setup and did hundred forty damage to a boss or something. You're like, oh, that's really really strong. Um, I know that's not like the damage cap. I've seen bigger numbers dropped, but um, with the setup and this and stuff, I think the, the the crashing tide really wins that race there. That's that's the boss killer. Um, so you do have two masteries. Um, so I must admit that I didn't actually do the masteries outside of um, like some testing stuff, but it does seem to be pretty obvious. Um, the top mastery where you wanna just have more tides than cards in your discard, uh, when you rest, it's pretty basic. You have to start the first rest either by burning a loss action or having six or seven, um, six with a loss, but seven cards in your um, active during your first cycle, then six, six, five, five, so on and so forth. Um, it does require you to go heavy tide, which I think is personally better for the um, defensive builds because you could always go for like, hey, I'm going to soft flesh, do the overwhelming wave, sharp chitin and, and like stuff and just... Um, put as much as possible so you're healing and then like cleansing swell so um, you end up having a lot of defense pretty early on I think it gets easier once you get to chaotic refraction but hey you can do this at like um, any level but um, I do think it also requires you to use pool of power 
because you can like leave that as a tight in play and then you start the next rest cycle with one already in play so this is a pretty good use for pull of power in my opinion but that's a good way to get a perk i don't think it's that hard and the second mastery is definitely like the defender build you have to get attacked at least five times and suffer no damage from attacks you can still like take damage from traps and other stuff but yeah um just time your item usage bring all your shielding stuff and try to be very careful against what the enemies are drawing you might get this naturally but personally i do think it's hard to take no damage from attacks unless you're like level nine and doing the like low tide um, defender build in which case that's a little bit more obvious but you're probably fighting higher level things that even shield four plus won't necessarily reliably do every attack you'll have to use your item still carefully but even then that's going for the most part going to be pretty easy to block all the damage from so that's that um in general for items before actually before i move on in general for items uh just the way that the fact that shield is cumulative with itself you're going to want to bring as many items that do provide shield obviously like for the starter items like heater shield but as you start to craft things get starts to get more craftables or like items that you can purchase uh that provide shield to you versus like uh, have, have adding disadvantage because shield just stacking shield does more than just um one shield on its own and frankly you're going to probably be taking a lot of hits because you're going to be requiring to mostly get in proximity of things um also because you have such a easy ways to get advantage i think stuff like eagle eye isn't as valuable but also because you have so many ways of like doing multiple attacks per turn stuff that do affect multiple attacks per turn like power potions become more powerful and it already is a really strong thing to begin with so for you it's huge so yeah those are generally how you're going to build items. Obviously, I don't want to go through like 300 items or something like that to say, pick these and these, but um, that's the general strategy. So, hope that helped. I know I talked for way too long, but that's okay. I heard that people like that. So, um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have played The Crashing Tide, what kind of style did you go? And did you like it? Um, and if this tide does help you, let me know and let us know in the comments. It does really help. And um, speaking of helping, obviously, um, thank you to our patrons, our Inox tier patrons especially. We really appreciate everything you do to help contribute to the channel. And yeah, it's just really a lot. I like put this all into my like, you know, my medical bills fund. So um, it, it, I really do appreciate it. So um, I am going to be trying to update it a little bit more often, but I've had, like I said, I put in the, I don't want to get too personal with personal life stuff, but had a, some really cool stuff that happened recently that ended up causing a lot of delays, but that's okay. Um, I'll get you if you do subscribe to Patreon, you do get some updates as well as early access to videos. So if that's something you're interested in, check it out. And if you don't, if you that you can't support us in that way, obviously hitting like does a lot. So just want to thank all patrons. You're amazing, and thanks all of you for watching.